Welcome to the Darkest Page Podcast. Tonight's episode is number 13 by M. R. James. Among the towns of Jutland, Viborg justly holds a high place. It is the seat of a bishopric. It has a handsome but almost entirely new cathedral, a charming garden, a lake of great beauty and many storks. Near it is Hald, accounted one of the prettiest things in Denmark. And hard by is Finderup, where Mask Stig murdered King Eric Glipping on St. Cecilia's Day in the year 1286. Fifty-six blows of square-headed iron maces were traced on Eric's skull when his tomb was opened in the 17th century. But I'm not writing a guidebook. There are good hotels in Viborg. Prizlers and the Phoenix are all that can be desired. But my cousin, whose experiences I have to tell you now, went to the Golden Lion the first time that he visited Viborg. He has not been there since, and the following pages will perhaps explain the reason of his abstention. The Golden Lion is one of the very few houses in the town that were not destroyed in the Great Fire of 1726, which practically demolished the cathedral, the Soggen Kirk, the Radus, and so much else that was old and interesting. It is a great red brick house, that is, the front is of brick, with corby steps on the gables and a text over the door, but the courtyard into which the omnibus drives is of black and white cage work in wood and plaster. The sun was declining in the heavens when my cousin walked up to the door, and the light smote full upon the imposing facade of the house. He was delighted with the old-fashioned aspect of the place, and promised himself a thoroughly satisfactory and amusing stay in an inn so typical of old Jutland. It was not my business in the ordinary sense of the word that he had brought Mr. Anderson to Viborg. He was engaged upon some researches into the church history of Denmark, and it had come to his knowledge that in the Riksarchiv of Viborg there were papers, saved from the fire, relating to the last days of Roman Catholicism in the country. He proposed, therefore, to spend a considerable time, perhaps as much as a fortnight or three weeks, in examining and copying these, and he hoped that the Golden Line would be able to give him a room of sufficient size to serve alike as a bedroom and a study. His wishes were explained to the landlord and, after a certain amount of thought, the latter suggested that perhaps it might be the best way for the gentleman to look at one or two of the larger rooms and pick one for himself. It seemed a good idea. The top floor was soon rejected as entailing too much getting upstairs after the day's work. The second floor contained no rooms of exactly the dimensions required but on the first floor there was a choice of two or three rooms which would, so far as the size went, suit admirably. The landlord was strong in favour of number 17, but Mr Anderson pointed out that its windows commanded only the blank wall of the next house, and that it would be very dark in the afternoon. Either number 12 or number 14 would be better, for both of them looked on the street, and the bright evening light and the pretty view would more than compensate him for the additional amount of noise. Eventually number 12 was selected. Like its neighbours, it had three windows, all on one side of the room. It was fairly high and unusually long. There was, of course, no fireplace, but the stove was handsome and rather old, a cast iron erection on the side of which was representation of Abraham sacrificing Isaac, and the inscription, One Bog Moss Cap 22. Nothing else in the room was remarkable. The only interesting picture was an old coloured print of the town, date about 1820. Supper time was approaching, but when Anderson, refreshed by the ordinary ablutions, descended the staircase, there were still a few minutes before the bell rang. He devoted them to examining the list of his fellow lodgers. As is usual in Denmark, their names were displayed on a large blackboard divided into columns and lines, the numbers of the rooms being painted in at the beginning of each line. The list was not exciting. There was an advocate, or Sagforer, a German and some Bergman from Copenhagen. The one and only point which suggested any food for thought was the absence of any number 13 from the tail of the rooms, and even this was a thing which Anderson had already noticed half a dozen times in his experience of Danish hotels. He could not help wondering whether the objection to the particular number, common as it is, was so widespread and so strong as to make it difficult to let a room so ticketed, and he resolved to ask the landlord if he and his colleagues in the profession had actually met with any clients who refused to accommodate in the 13th room. He had nothing to tell me. I am given the story as I heard it from him, 
about what passed at supper, and the evening which was spent in unpacking and arranging his clothes, books and papers was not more eventful. Towards eleven o'clock he resolved to go to bed, but with him, as with a good many other guests nowadays, an almost necessary preliminary to bed, if he meant to sleep, was the reading of a few pages of print, and he now remembered that the particular book which he had been reading in the train, and which alone would satisfy him at that present moment, was in the pocket of his greatcoat, then hanging on a peg outside the dining room. To run down and secure it was the work of a moment, and as the passages were by no means dark, it was not difficult for him to find his way back to his own door, so at least he thought. But when he arrived there and turned the handle, the door entirely refused to open, and he caught the sound of hasty movement towards it from within. He had tried the wrong door, of course. Was his own room to the right or to the left? He glanced at the number. It was 13. His room would be on the left, and so it was. And not before he had been in bed for some minutes, had read his wanted three or four pages of his book, blown out his light and turned over to go to sleep, did it occur to him that, whereas on the blackboard of the hotel there had been no number 13, there was undoubtedly a room numbered 13 in the hotel. He felt rather sorry he had not chosen it for his own. Perhaps he might have done the landlord a little service by occupying it, and given him the chance of saying that it was well-born English gentleman had lived in it for three weeks and liked it very much. But probably it was as a servant's room or something of the kind. After all, it was more likely not so large or good a room as his own, and he looked drowsily about the room, which was fairly perceptible in the half-light from the street lamp. It was a curious effect, he thought. Rooms usually look larger in a dim light than a full one, but this seemed to have contracted in length, and grown proportionally higher. Well, well. Sleep was more important than these vague ruminations, and to sleep he went. On the day after his arrival, Anson attacked the Rigsavkiv of Vyborg. He was, as one might expect in Denmark, kindly received, and access to all that he wished to see was made as easy for him as possible. The documents laid before him were far more numerous and interesting than he had at all anticipated, Besides official papers, there was a large bundle of correspondence relating to Bishop Jorgen Free, the last Roman Catholic who held the sea, and in these there cropped up many amusing and what are called intimate details of private life and individual character. There was much talk of a house owned by the bishop, but not inhabited by him in the town. Its tenant was apparently somewhat of a scandal and a stumbling block to the reforming party. He was a disgrace, they wrote, to the city. He practised secret and wicked arts, and had sold his soul to the enemy. It was of a piece with the gross corruption and superstition of the Babylonish church that such a viper and blood-sucking troll man that should be patronised and harboured by the bishop. The bishop met these approaches boldly. He protested his own abhorrence of all such things as secret arts, and required his antagonists to bring the matter before the proper court, of course, the spiritual court, and sift it to the bottom. No one could be more ready and willing than himself to condemn Mag, Nichols, Franken, if the evidence showed him to have been guilty of any of the crimes informally alleged against him. Anderson had not time to do more than glance at the next letter of the Protestant leader, Rasmus Nielsen, before the record office was closed for the day, but he gathered its general tenor, which was to the effect that Christian men were no longer bound by the decisions of bishops of Rome, and that the bishop's court was not, and could not be, a fit or competent tribunal to judge so grave and weighty a cause. On leaving the office, Mr Anderson was accompanied by the old gentleman who presided over it, and as they walked, the conversation very naturally turned to the papers of which I have just been speaking. Herr Scavenius, the archivist of Vyborg, though very well informed as to the general run of the documents under this charge, was not a specialist in those of the Reformation period. He was much interested in what Anson had to tell about them. He looked forward with great pleasure, he said, to seeing the publication in which Mr Anson spoke of embodying their contents. This house of the Bishop Free, he added, it is a great puzzle to me where it could have stood. I have studied carefully the topography of old Vyborg, but it is most unlucky of the old terrier of the bishop's property which was made in 1560 and of which we have the greater part in the archive. Just the piece which had the list of the town property is missing. Never mind. Perhaps I shall someday succeed to find him. After taking some exercise, I forget exactly how and where, Anderson went back to the Golden Lion, his supper, his game of patience and his bed. 
On the way to his room, it occurred to him that he had forgotten to talk to the landlord about the omission of number 13 from the hotel, and also that he might as well make sure that number 13 did actually exist before he made any reference to the matter. The decision was not difficult to arrive at. There was the door with its number as plain as could be, and work of some kind was evidently going on inside, for as he neared the door, he could hear footsteps and voices, or a voice within. During the few seconds in which he halted to make sure of the number of the footsteps ceased, seemingly very near the door, and he was a little startled at hearing a quick hissing breathing as of a person in strong excitement. He went on to his own room, and again he was surprised to find how much smaller it seemed now than it had when he selected it. It was a slight disappointment, but only slight. If he found it really not large enough, he could very easily shift to another. In the meantime, he wanted something. As far as I can remember, it was a pocket handkerchief out of his portmanteau, which had been placed by the porter on a very inadequate trestle or stool against the wall at the furthest end of the room from his bed. Here was a very curious thing. The portmanteau was not to be seen. It had been moved by officious servants. Doubtless the contents had been put in the wardrobe. No, none of them were there. This was vexatious. The idea of thief he dismissed at once. Such things rarely happened in Denmark, but some piece of stupidity had certainly been performed, which is not so uncommon, and the stupige must be severely spoken to. Whatever it was that he wanted, it was not so necessary to his comfort that he could not wait till the morning for it, and he therefore settled not to ring the bell and disturb the servants. He went to the window, the right-hand window it was, and looked out on the quiet street. There was a tall building opposite, with large spaces of dead wall. No passers-by. A dark night, and very little to be seen of any kind. The light was behind him, and he could see his own shadow clearly cast on the wall opposite. Also, the shadow of a bearded man in number 11 on the left, who passed to and fro in shirt sleeves once or twice, and was seen first brushing his hair, and later on in a nightgown. Also, the shadow of the occupant of number 13 on the right. This might be more interesting. Number 13 was, like himself, leaning on his elbows on the windowsill, looking out into the street. He seemed to be a tall, thin man, or was it by any chance a woman? At least it was someone who covered his or her head with some kind of drapery before going to bed, and, he thought, must be possessed of a red lampshade, and the lamp must be flickering very much. There was a distinct playing up and down of a dull red light on the opposite wall. He craned out a little to see if he could make any more of the figure, but beyond the fold of some light, perhaps white, material on the windowsill, he could see nothing. Now came a distant step in the street, and its approach seemed to recall number 13 to a sense of his exposed position, for very swiftly and suddenly he swept aside from the window, and his red light went out. Anderson, who had been smoking a cigarette, laid the end of it on the windowsill, and went to bed. Next morning he was woke by the stupige with hot water, etc. He roused himself, and after thinking on the correct Danish words, said as distinctly as he could, You must have moved my portmanteau. Where is it? As is not uncommon, the maid laughed, and went away without making any distinct answer. Anderson, rather irritated, sat up in bed, intended to call her back, but he remained sitting up, staring straight in front of him. There was his portmanteau on its trestle, exactly where he had seen the porter put it when he first arrived. This was a rude shock for a man who prided himself on his accuracy of observation. How it could possibly have escaped him the night before he did not pretend to understand. At any rate, there it was now. The daylight showed more than the portmanteau. It let the true proportions of the room with its three windows appear, and satisfied its tenants that his choice after all had not been a bad one. When he was almost dressed, he walked to the middle of the three windows to look out at the weather. Another shock awaited him. Strangely unobservant he must have been last night. He could have sworn ten times over that he had been smoking at the right-hand window, the last thing before he went to bed, and here was his cigarette end on the sill of the middle window. He started to go down to breakfast, rather late, but number 13 was later. Here were his boots still outside his door. A gentleman's boots. So then, number 13 was a man, not a woman. Just then he caught sight of the number on the door. It was 14. He thought he must have passed number 13 without noticing it. Three stupid mistakes in 12 hours were too much for a methodical, accurate-minded man, so he turned back to make sure. The next number to 14 was number 12, his own room. There was no number 13 at all. 
After some minutes devoted to a careful consideration of everything he had had to eat and drink during the last 24 hours, Anderson decided to give the question up. If his sight or his brain were giving way, he would have plenty of opportunities for ascertaining the fact. If not, then he was evidently being treated to a very interesting experience. In either case, the development of events would certainly be worth watching. During the day, he continued his examination of the Episcopal correspondence which I have already summarised. To his disappointment, it was incomplete. Only one other letter had been found which referred to the affair of Mag Nicholas Franken. It was from the Bishop Jorgen Free to the Rasmus Nielsen. He said, Although we are not in the least degree inclined to assent to your judgment concerning our court, and shall be prepared if need be to withstand you to the utmost in that behalf, yet for as much as our trusty and well-beloved Mag Nicholas Franken, against whom you have dared to allege certain false and malicious charges, hath been suddenly removed from among us. It is apparent that the question for this time falls. But for as much as you further allege that the Apostle and Evangelist St. John, in his heavenly apocalypse, describes the Holy Roman Church under the guise and symbols of the Scarlet Woman, be it known to you, etc. Search as he might, Anderson could find no sequel to this letter, nor any clue to the cause or manner of the removal of the Caseus Belli. He could only suppose that Franken had died suddenly, and as there was only two days between the date of Nielsen's last letter, when Franken was evidently still in being, and that of the bishop's letter, the death must have been completely unexpected. In the afternoon he paid a short visit to Hald, and took his tea at Bakerland, nor could he notice, though he was in the somewhat nervous frame of mind, that there was any indication of such a failure of eye or brain as his experience of the morning had led him to fear. At supper he found himself next to the landlord. What? he asked him after some indifferent conversation. Is the reason why most of the hotels one visits in this country, the number 13 is left out of the list of rooms? I see you have none here. The landlord seemed amused. <laughs> To think you should have noticed a thing like that. I've thought about it once or twice myself, to tell you the truth. An educated man, as I've said, has no business with these superstitious notions. I was brought up myself here in the high school of Viborg, and our old master was always a man to set his face against anything of that kind. He's been dead now this many years. A fine upstanding man he was, and ready with his hands as well as his head. I recollect us boys one snowy day. Here he plunged into reminiscence. Then you don't think there is any particular objection to having a number 13, said Anderson. Ah, to be sure. Well, you understand, I was brought up to the business of my poor old father. He kept a hotel in Arras first, and then, when we were born, he moved to Viborg here, which was his native place, and had the phoenix here until he died. That was in 1876. Then I started business in Silkborg, and only the year before last I moved into this house. Then followed more details as to the state of the house and business when first taken over. And when you came here, there was a number 13? No, no. I was going to tell you about that. You see, in a place like this, the commercial class, the travellers, are what we have to provide for in general. And put them in number 13? Why, they'd sooner sleep in the street or sooner. As far as I'm concerned myself, it wouldn't make a penny difference to me what the number of my rooms was. And so I've often said to them, but they stick to it, that it brings them bad luck. Quantities of stories they have among them of men that have slept in a number 13 and never been the same again, or lost their best customers, or one thing and another, said the landlord after searching for a more graphic phrase. Then what do you use your number 13 for? said Anderson, conscious as he said the words of a curious anxiety quite disproportionate to the importance of the question. My number 13? Why don't I tell you that there isn't such a thing in the house? I thought you might have noticed that. If there was, it would be next door to your own room. Well, yes, only I happened to think. That is, I fancied last night that I had seen a door number 13 in that passage. And really, I am almost certain I must have been right, for I saw it in the night before as well. Of course, Herr Christensen laughed this notion to scorn, as Anderson had expected, and emphasised with much iteration the fact that no number 13 existed, or had existed before him in that hotel. Anderson was in some ways relieved by his certainty, but still puzzled, and began to think the best way to make sure whether he had indeed been subject to an illusion or not was to invite the landlord to his room to smoke a cigar later on in the evening. Some photographs of English towns which he had with him formed a sufficiently good excuse. 
Herr Christensen was flattered by the invitation and most willingly accepted it. At about 10 o'clock he was to make his appearance, but before that Anson had some letters to write, and retired for the purpose of writing them. He almost blushed to himself at confessing it, but he could not deny that it was the fact that he was becoming quite nervous about the question of the existence of number 13, so much so that he had approached his room by the way of number 11, in order that he might not be obliged to pass the door, or the place where the door ought to be. He looked quickly and suspiciously about the room when he entered it, but there was nothing beyond the indefinable air of being smaller than usual to warrant any misgivings. There was no question of the presence or absence of his portmanteau tonight. He had himself emptied it of its contents and lodged it under his bed. With a certain effort, he dismissed the thought of a number 13 from his mind and sat down to his writing. Occasionally a door opened in the passage and a pair of boots was thrown out, or a bagman walked past humming to himself, and outside from time to time a cart thundered over the atrocious cobblestones, or a quick step hurried along the flags. Anderson finished his letters, ordered him whiskey and soda, and then went to the window and studied the dead wall opposite and the shadows upon it. As far as he could remember, number 14 had been occupied by the lawyer, a staid man who said little at meals, being generally engaged in studying a small bundle of papers beside his plate. Apparently, however, he was in the habit of giving vent to his animal spirits when alone. Why else should he be dancing? The shadow from the next room evidently showed that he was. Again and again his thin form crossed the window, his arms waved and a gaunt leg was kicked up with surprising agility. He seemed to be barefoot and the floor must be well laid, for no sound betrayed his movements. Sagfora Herr Anders Jensen danced at ten o'clock at night in the hotel bedroom, seemed a fitting subject for a historical painting in the grand style, and Anderson's thoughts, like those of Emily in the Mysteries of Udolpho, began to arrange themselves in the following lines. When I return to my hotel at ten o'clock p.m., the waiters think I am unwell. I do not care for them, but when I've locked my chamber door and put my boots outside, I dance all night upon the floor. And even if my neighbours swore, I go on dancing all the more, for I am acquainted with the law, and despite of all their jaw, their protests I deride. Had not the landlord at this moment knocked at the door, it is probable that quite a long poem might have been laid before the reader. To judge from his look of surprise when he found himself in the room, Herr Christensen was struck, as Anson had been, by something unusual in its aspect. But he made no remark. Anderson's photographs interested him mightily, and formed the text of many autobiographical discourses. Nor is it quite clear how the conversation could have been diverted into the desired channel of number 13, had not the lawyer at this moment begun to sing, and to sing in a manner which could leave no doubt in anyone's mind that he was either exceedingly drunk or raving mad. It was a high, thin voice that they heard, and it seemed dry as if from long disuse. Of words or tune there was no question. It went sailing up to a surprising height, and was carried down with a despairing moan as of a winter wind in a hollow chimney, or an organ whose wind failed suddenly. It was a really horrible sound, and Anderson felt that if he had been alone he must have fled for refuge and society to some neighbour bagman's room. The landlord sat open-mouthed, I don't understand it, he said at last, wiping his forehead. It is dreadful. I've heard it once before, but I made sure it was a cat. Is he mad? said Anderson. He must be. And what a sad thing, such a good customer too, and so successful in his business, by what I hear, and a young family to bring up. Just then came an impatient knock at the door, and the knocker entered without waiting to be asked. It was the lawyer. In dishevile and very rough-haired, and very angry, he looked. I beg pardon, sir, he said, but I should be much obliged if you would kindly desist. Here he stopped, for it was evident that neither of the persons before him was responsible for the disturbance, and after a few moments lull, it swelled forth again more wildly than before. But what in the name of heaven does it mean? broke out the lawyer. Where is it? Who is it? Am I going out of my mind? Surely, Herr Jensen, it comes from your room next door. Isn't there a cat or something stuck in the chimney? This was the best that occurred to Anderson to say, and he realised its futility as he spoke. But anything was better than to stand and listen to that horrible voice, and look at the broad, white face of the landlord, all perspiring and quivering as he clutched the arms of his chair. Impossible, said the lawyer. Impossible, there is no chimney. I came here because I was convinced the noise was going on here. 
it was certainly in the next room to mine. Was there no door between yours and mine? said Anderson eagerly. No, sir, said Herr Jensen rather sharply, at least not this morning. Ah, said Anderson, nor tonight? I'm not sure, said the lawyer with some hesitation. Suddenly the crying or singing voice in the next room died away, and the singer was heard seemingly to laugh to himself in a crooning manner. The three men actually shivered at the sound. Then there was a silence. Come, said the lawyer. What have you to say, Herr Christensen? What does this mean? Good heaven, said Christensen. How should I tell? I know not more than you, gentlemen. I pray I may never hear such a noise again. So do I, said Herr Jensen, and he added something under his breath. Anderson thought it sounded like the last words of the Psalter, Ominous Spiritus Laudet Dominium, but he could not be sure. But we must do something, said Anderson. The three of us, shall we go and investigate the next room? But that is Herr Jensen's room, wailed the landlord. It is no use, he has come from there himself. I am not so sure, said Jensen. I think this gentleman is right. We must go and see. The only weapons of defence that could be mustered on the spot were a stick and umbrella. The expedition went out into the passage, not without quakings. There was a deadly quiet outside, but a light shone from under the next door. Anderson and Jensen approached it. The latter turned the handle and gave a sudden, vigorous push. No use. The door stood fast. Herr Christensen, said Jensen, will you go and fetch the strongest servant you have in this place? We must see this through. The landlord nodded and hurried off, glad to be away from the scene of action. Jensen and Anderson remained outside looking at the door. It is number 13, you see, said the latter. Yes, there is your door and there is mine, said Jensen. My room has three windows in the daytime, said Anderson with difficulty, suppressing a laugh. By George, so is mine, said the lawyer, turning and looking at Anderson. His back was now to the door. In that moment, the door opened and an arm came out and clawed at his shoulder. It was clad in ragged, yellowish linen, and the bare skin where it could be seen had long grey hair upon it. Anderson was just in time to pull Jensen out of its reach with a cry of disgust and fright when the door shut again, and a low laugh was heard. <laughs> Jensen had seen nothing, but when Anderson hurriedly told him what a risk he had run, he fell into a great state of agitation, and suggested that they should retire from the Enterprise and lock themselves up in one or other of their rooms. However, while he was developing this plan, the landlord and two able-bodied men arrived on the scene, all looking rather serious and alarmed. Jensen met them with a torrent of description and explanation, which did not at all tend to encourage them for the fray. The men dropped the crowbars they had brought, and said flatly that they were not going to risk their throats in the devil's den. The landlord was miserably nervous and undecided, conscious that if the danger was not faced his hotel was ruined, and very loath to face it himself. Luckily, Anderson hit upon a way of rallying the demoralised force. Is this, he said, the Danish courage I have heard so much of? It isn't a German in there, and if it was, we are five to one. The servants and Jensen were stung into action by this and made a dash at the door. Stop, said Anderson. Don't lose your heads. You stay out here with the light, landlord. And one of you two men break in the door, and don't go in when it gives way. The men nodded and the younger stepped forward, raised his crowbar and dealt a tremendous blow on the upper panel. The result was not in the least what any of them anticipated. There was no cracking or rending of wood, only a dull sound as if the solid wall had been struck. The man dropped his tool with a shout and began rubbing his elbow. His cry drew their eyes upon him for a moment, then Anderson looked at the door again. It was gone. The plaster wall of the passage stared him in the face with a considerable gash in it where the crowbar had struck it. Number 13 had passed out of existence. For a brief space they stood perfectly still, 
gazing at the blank wall. An early cock in the yard beneath was heard to crow, and as Anderson glanced in the direction of the sound, he saw through the window at the end of the long passage that the eastern sky was paling to the dawn. Perhaps, said the landlord with hesitation, you gentlemen would like another room for tonight, a double-bedded one? Neither Jensen nor Anderson was averse to the suggestion. They felt inclined to hunt in couples after their late experience. It was found convenient when each of them went to his room to collect the articles he wanted for the night that the other should go with him and hold the candle. They noticed that both number 12 and number 14 had three windows. Next morning the same party reassembled in number 12. The landlord was naturally anxious to avoid engaging outside help and yet it was imperative that the mystery attaching to that part of the house should be cleared up. Accordingly, the two servants had been induced to take upon them the function of carpenters. The furniture was cleared away, and at the cost of a good many irretrievably damaged planks, that portion of the floor was taken up which lay nearest to number 14. You will naturally suppose that a skeleton, say that of Mag Nicholas Franken, was discovered. That was not so. What they did find lying between the beams which supported the flooring was a small copper box. In it was a neatly folded vellum document with about 20 lines of writing. Both Anderson and Jensen, who proved to be something of a paleographer, were much excited by this discovery which promised to afford the key to these extraordinary phenomena. I possess a copy of an astrological work which I have never read. It has, by way of frontispiece, a woodcut by Hans Sebold Behem, representing a number of sages seated round a table. This detail may enable connoisseurs to identify the book. I cannot myself recollect its title, and it is not at this moment within reach, but the fly leaves of it are covered with writing, and during the ten years in which I have owned the volume, I have not been able to determine which way up this writing ought to be read, much less in what language it is. Not dissimilar was the position of Anderson and Jensen after the protracted examination to which they submitted to the document in the copper box. After two days' contemplation of it, Jensen, who was the bolder spirit of the two, hazarded the conjecture that the language was either Latin or Old Danish. Anderson ventured upon no surmises, and was very willing to surrender the box and the parchment to the Historical Society of Vyborg to be placed in their museum. I had the whole story from him a few months later, as we sat in a wood near Uppsala after a visit to the library there, where we, or rather I, had laughed over the contract by which Daniel Salthenius, in later life professor of Hebrew at Koinersberg, sold himself to Satan. Anderson was not really amused. You idiot, he said, meaning Salthenius, who was only an undergraduate when he committed that indiscretion. How did he know what company he was courting? and when I suggested the unusual considerations, he only grunted. That same afternoon he told me what you have read, but he refused to draw any inferences from it, and to assent to any that I drew for him. Thank you for listening to the Darkest Page podcast. I have been your host, and I wish you pleasant dreams. <laughs> <laughs>